a great case in Arkansas with a man who was raised Baptist and, as, as I recall, actually went to Baptist seminary. But after uh, he was told to shave his beard multiple times and had, had returned to work at this company three times, suddenly he said, oh, I can't shave it now because I, I believe in the Jewish faith. And the court, on the record, said, there is no evidence this man is Jewish. There is no evidence that he practices the Jewish faith. But we believe him when he says that a supreme being came to him in a vision and told him to wear a beard. Therefore, we require the employer to accommodate the beard. And the employer lost that case because they failed to accommodate or come up with a legitimate reason why it would be an undue hardship uh, if the man was allowed to wear a beard. One of the most popular cases that you hear talked about regarding uh, piercings is the Cloutier versus Costco case. There was an employee who worked in the deli at Costco who accumulated a significant amount of hardware in her face, ears, etc. over time. And Costco, uh, according to the case, as I read it, realized that there was a risk some of those would fall on somebody's sandwich, I presume. And so they said you can no longer work in the deli. Uh, and she asked for a transfer to the front where she could be a cashier. They put her out there in front, and there's complaints about her, and they ultimately have to go to her and say, look at, you know, you can't have all the facial piercings and work in the front of the store. And she claimed that was religious discrimination. She said she was a member of the Church of Body Modification, which at the time the case was decided uh, allegedly had a thousand members. A and my personal opinion, most of them uh, probably were suing an employer somewhere, hence the membership in the church. But nevertheless, you know, there was this religious association. And the big issue in the case was, did you have to accommodate something like that? I think the scariest thing is, is the court said that it was not going to question whether or not that was a legitimate religion or not. And we've seen a trend of, uh, of courts doing that. Understandably, it's a bit of a political hot potato. Um, and instead, they asked, was there an adequate uh, accommodation here? What doesn't get talked about is that Costco said to her, you can either cover them with Band-Aids or you can put clear retainers in the piercings. Uh, most people overlooked that. Uh, Costco attempted to make an accommodation. And I, I think employers who don't realize that may just say, no facial piercings, regardless of religious issues, and not offer that. I think it's important in all of these cases that you consider offering some kind of accommodation if you can think of it, even if it may not be all that attractive to the employee. Costco ended up winning that case. Uh, I went to appeal, so it's actually a published decision. In the arena of appearance discrimination and, and accommodation, weight discrimination is one of the common issues that HR people bring up. Weight is a protected class in two ways. One is uh, morbid obesity, uh, which generally means twice someone's normal body weight or 100 pounds over their normal body weight. It's a medical term that courts have picked up. A number of federal district courts have ruled that if someone is morbidly obese, they are disabled. But the more common ADA disability case involving weight often is a regarded as disabled case, where the employee doesn't neatly fit the definition of disabled, but their boss or the HR department treated them as disabled by considering their weight to have physical impairments or physically limit them in some way. We also think that there is a heightened awareness amongst employees that weight may be treated as a disability now. So they're listening very carefully to what their supervisors say to them that may involve weight, and they're now savvy enough to turn a comment into a regarded as claim. There's really two things that employers can do to increase their ability to defend a regarded as claim. Uh, one is supervisor training. Many managers do not realize that a offhanded joke about weight may someday be the basis of a regarded as disabled claim. Calling your coworker chubby uh, used to be, you know, unkind and unfair treatment by a boss. Now it's also a piece of evidence in a regarded as claim. Managers need to understand that. The second thing is HR departments have to have clear procedures on how to handle a request for accommodation, regardless of whether the manager actually thinks there's a disability involved, so that the HR department is the one that's deciding is this really a, dis a disability and how should it be handled.
I think the fact that weight is visible does make it a more likely target for a lawsuit these days, um, not just from an accommodation standpoint, but from a harassment standpoint. And I think if HR people are feeling tension over the weight issue, it's because they know that their managers are out there in the workforce visibly seeing and very aware of overweight employees, and therefore they are likely to be dealing with it without the HR department's help. That is the scary thing for an HR person. Tattoos and facial piercings, or any kind of piercing for that matter, has become a, a much more common topic for HR people because in society we see a lot more of it going on. Tattoos are much more common today than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. And the question for HR people struggling to advise their internal customers on this is, well, how much of this do we have to accommodate? You know, there, there are concerns about customers being turned off. On the other hand, courts and employees are struggling to find ways to justify their tattoos and their piercings such that they can't be told to cover them up or remove them. Religion and the facial hair and head garbs is a common issue. It, it fluctuates a little bit in popularity in the court cases. After 9-11, there was a lot of litigation involving facial hair and head garb because there was a spike in cases of Middle Eastern discrimination and accommodation requests. And I think facial hair is something sometimes employers don't take seriously enough. Um, there are m more than one religion out there that involve facial hair requirements. And the courts have been pretty liberal about allowing employees to claim they actually hold these religious beliefs. You can't have management that is so rigid with things like facial hair that they don't have the flexibility to account for religious accommodation issues or even medical accommodation issues. Many people just don't realize that there are medical conditions that prevent a man from shaving his face. And if they actually have the condition, and they request the accommodation to wear a neatly trimmed beard, and the employer says no, in many cases that's going to be a violation of the disability discrimination laws, merely because the company was ignorant of what the issues were surrounding the facial hair. I think the employers who decide not to accommodate someone's facial hair or an issue like that are trying to have some standardization, and they normally do believe that there are legitimate business interests for what they're doing. The problem is, is they don't approach it from a legal standpoint, they approach it purely from the business standpoint. And they aren't using the right terminology and following the right procedures. If you look at accommodation cases that go badly for the employer, most of the time it's not the decision, the ultimate decision that got them in trouble, it's the way that they got there. They failed to follow the process of having an interactive discussion with the employee to explore the request and they failed to offer alternative accommodations that while may not be satisfactory to the employee would satisfy a court in terms of an employer showing that they're really trying to do the right thing. I think we're going to see changes in the kinds of claims that are brought based on gender stereotyping. On the one hand, as women and men begin to play increasingly roles that don't correspond to the stereotypes, one would hope that the stereotypes would lessen. On the other hand, to the, very often, the first in any given position, the first woman who is a chief operating officer of a company, the first man who may have a more nurturing role still may face those kinds of stereotypes. So I think as long as individuals harbor bias and have un some unconscious feelings in this area, we're still going to see some of these claims. An example of a decision that would be based on a gender stereotype would be denying a woman a promotion because of the fear or belief that she's going to be more emotional than a man. That would be sort of a classic example of gender stereotyping. Another example would be denying a man a promotion because the position requires someone to be nurturing and the belief that the man can't be as nurturing as a woman. So gender stereotyping, both false and illegal, can apply equally to women and men alike, although I think it's more likely in the business world to apply to women than to men. But as women gain more power, I think we'll see more stereotyping claims brought by men. Sometimes in diversity programs, when we try to 
overcome unconscious bias and stereotyping, we sell what may be seen as positive or benign stereotypes. In fact, there's no such thing as a benign stereotype. Let me give you an example. The stereotype that women are interpersonally stronger than men. There may be some women that are interpersonally stronger than men, but that is obviously not going to be universally true. There are a lot of problems with that kind of stereotype. One, it will be factually false in some cases. Number two, it can be the predicate for a discrimination claim by a man. And number three, what it does is raise the bar for the so-called beneficiaries of the stereotype. If we say that women are interpersonally stronger than men, then if you have a woman who is just as interpersonally strong as a man, no stronger, no better, just the same, based on the higher expectation, she may seem weaker. So I worry about the positive stereotypes because what they often say is being equal than is not enough. You need to be better than to meet our expectations. And every positive stereotype has a more malignant underbelly. If you say someone is interpersonally stronger, a synonym for interpersonally stronger might be more sensitive. And it's not far from some, saying someone's sensitive to saying they're too sensitive. And then that stereotype ends up pigeonholing or limiting the opportunities available to women. If HR has reason to believe that stereotypes may be underlying a manager's decision making, it's important that HR deal with it directly, but not necessarily make immediate accusations that you're engaging in deliberate, invidious sexual stereotyping. Because number one, it may not be true. And number two, that's not going to be an effective way to bring about understanding if, in fact, that's the case. If a manager gives a dis basis for a decision that sounds like it may be a proxy for stereotyping, what HR should do is say, look, I'd like to talk with you and get a better understanding. What's the reason why you made the decision that you did? You rejected this individual because you thought that she was too aggressive. And I'm concerned that there may be, I'm concerned how that might play. Can you tell me what she said, what she did that was too aggressive? And if HR can create through discussion a legitimate factual predicate that shows it's not gender stereotyping, there were specific behaviors where the manager was objectively too aggressive, then the problem may be with the label. Maybe the better label there would be the person was too confrontational, always arguing with people. That sounds a lot more gender neutral than too aggressive, which is a label sometimes used for a woman who's no more aggressive than the average guy. So what I think HR wants to do is deal with the issue head on, not assume that there's unconscious bias or impermissible stereotyping, not assume there's not. Have a dialogue, ask the questions, figure out what the basis was for the decision. And if there is a concern that it may be gender stereotyping, then HR can emphasize with the business leader not only the legal, but the business reasons why the stereotyping is problematic. If the problem is the label and not the behavior, not the decision, then perhaps the label needs to be changed and the decision is still okay.